class. Welcome to lecture 24. And in this lecture, we're going to take a look at the atmospheric boundary layer, which is a vertical section of the atmosphere, which is usually uh, at the lowest point in the atmosphere. And we're also going to take a look at some of the physical processes and atmospheric phenomenon that occur in the boundary layer. So let's go ahead and start things off by first introducing the idea of the atmospheric boundary layer and what exactly we mean by atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, there's a couple other term, uh, terms to refer to the same thing. Another term that you'll sometimes run across is planetary boundary layer, or PBL. Uh, some people will also just refer to it as boundary layer without atmospheric or planetary in front of it. But uh, they all basically refer to the same thing. And that by definition, the atmospheric boundary layer is the lowest layer of the troposphere uh, that is directly influenced by the Earth's surface. Uh, this is one characterization of it. Another characterization of it is a, a region that where friction is especially strong and where you have a lot of turbulent flow. So if the atmospheric boundary layer extends, say, up to one kilometer in altitude above ground level, then from the surface up to one kilometer, you've got a region of relatively strong friction and turbulent flow. And then above that, you don't have as much friction or as much turbulent flow. And usually there's a really sharp cutoff. And right at that sharp cutoff is where the top of the boundary layer resides. So as you go up, so in the example I just cited, if you go up one kilometer, um, when you go up from the surface to one kilometer, you're going to be encountering strong friction and turbulent flow. And then usually just above one kilometer, the amount of friction and turbulent flow drops off rather uh, rapidly. So this is usually a pretty sharp and well-defined boundary, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes it's really hard to identify uh, the depth of the atmosphere of boundary layer based on the definition of friction and turbulent flow. And during the daytime, when the uh, and we'll talk about why this is the case and uh, a little bit later on, but the depth of the boundary layer can be as deep as two to three kilometers during the daytime, and sometimes in more extreme cases, like in the height of summer and uh, regions that are subjected to very intense sunlight, the depth can be even uh, higher than that. It can be up to four, sometimes even five kilometers. But uh, you don't, you you probably won't see that very often. Usually, the depth of the atmosphere and boundary layer will usually be around one kilometer, sometimes two to three kilometers, uh, especially during the summer. And uh, that's during the daytime. And during the nighttime, the depth of the boundary layer can shrink rather dramatically. Um, usually during the nighttime, uh, the boundary layer depth is probably around 100 meters, maybe a little bit more than that. But depending on the terrain and some other factors, sometimes the boundary layer can be even lower than that. Sometimes it can be uh, 10 or 20 or even 30 meters uh, above ground level. So the uh, main takeaway message here is during the daytime, the, uh, the boundary layer, which is this region of really strong friction turbulent flow, uh, can be as deep as one to two, even three kilometers during the daytime. But at night, uh, this layer shrinks uh, pretty uh, pretty profoundly. It usually decreases to around 100 to 200 meters. Uh, again, that's a region of 100 to 100, 200 meters above ground level, or from the surface up to 100 to 200 meters where uh, friction is uh, relatively strong compared to the atmosphere above it. And on extreme cases, it can be even lower than that. But let's go ahead and talk about some of the factors that influence the depth of the boundary layer. And probably the most pronounced of which is the degree of diabetic heating. That is, how much uh, solar radiation uh, is the ground absorbing? Because as the ground absorbs the solar radiation, it uh, heats up the adjacent air. And this, and this heating process results in rising motion, which... Uh, you basically get what we refer to as rising thermals, which are columns of relatively hot air that are ascending upward. And as those columns of air ascend upward, they push the boundary layer uh, upward with them as they uh, as they go upward. And eventually, they'll encounter a point in the atmosphere where they can't go up anymore because they're not buoyant anymore. And usually around that region is where the top of the boundary layer will reside. So if you have really strong heating, then you're going to get more of those upward motions, and you're more likely to get a really deep boundary layer if that is, in fact, the case. And that's one of the reasons why the atmospheric boundary layer tends to be deeper during the summer, because your diabetic heating is much stronger in the summer. And in places like the desert southwest, where the air is also really dry, uh, it's much easier to heat up the air. The heat, air heats up more rapidly, and that much more rapid heating of the air can result in an extremely deep boundary layer in, say, somewhere like the desert southwest or over Death Valley, where it's usually in that region. If you're going to get an atmospheric boundary layer that's four or five kilometers deep, that's usually where it's going to occur, because not only do you have the really intense sunlight in the summer, but you've also got really dry air, so it's a lot easier to heat up that adjacent air and set those thermals, those rising columns of air in motion. Thank you. 
Another thing that influences the depth of the boundary layer is the terrain itself. If you've got an area of really rough terrain, that is, maybe there's a lot of mountains, a lot of hills, a lot of trees, maybe it's a highly urbanized area, uh, that will tend to give you a deeper boundary layer because that's going to result in more turbulent flow, especially down near the surface. But if you've got a relatively smooth landscape, like maybe, some, maybe somewhere in the plains where it's all just grasslands or even out over the ocean, uh, then you're not going to have as much turbulent flow. So your atmospheric boundary layer is not going to be uh, as deep. It's going to be shallower as opposed to a, a landscape which has really rough terrain. That has a lot of hills, trees, valleys, uh, maybe a really urbanized landscape. That will have a much deeper boundary layer because it has more turbulent flow. And another factor that can influence the depth of the atmosphere boundary layer is something called evapotranspiration. Uh, basically, this is a process of plant moisture being evaporated into its surroundings, and, and that will in turn increase the amount of moisture content in the atmosphere. So if you've got uh, a lot of grass or even a lot of crops, this is something that's pretty common to see in cropland where, they, uh, where the ground is basically covered in plantation, uh, some of which can absorb a lot of moisture. If that moisture evaporates into the sounding air, you can actually increase the dew point that way. You can increase the amount of buoyancy that an air parcel will have. And if the air parcel has more buoyancy, then it will rise to a greater height before it becomes negatively buoyant. So if you've got a lot of evapotranspiration, then you're going to have much more moisture in the surrounding air, which means that your air parcels, your rising columns of air, have a better chance of attaining a higher altitude. So in regions where there's a lot of cropland, sometimes the atmosphere boundary layer is a little bit deeper there. And the reason why is because of this evapotranspiration process. It's a process of the plant moisture being evaporated into the surrounding air, which increases the buoyancy of the rising columns of air that push the boundary layer upward. And we've kind of talked about this already, but the boundary layer is primary form, primarily formed by the Earth absorbing the incoming solar radiation. This is why the boundary layer is usually deepest during the summer. And then as that energy is absorbed, it's transferred into the surrounding air, which in turn inc heats, up the surrounding, uh, heats up the surrounding air. That is the air that's in contact with the ground. And that air becomes buoyant and then wants to rise. So this is what we kind of talked about. But one detail we didn't actually talk about is the as the air is rising, it's cooling adiabatically, meaning it's cooling by the dry adiabatic lapse rate, or roughly 9.8 degrees C per kilometer. And as we'll see a little bit later on, when we take a look at how to identify the boundary layer on a sounding, you'll see that the boundary layer is characterized by a region of dry adiabatic lapse rate. And sometimes near the surface, if you've got especially strong heating, you can actually end up with uh, what's referred to as a super adiabatic layer, meaning the environmental uh, temperature decreases much more uh, decreases more rapidly than dry adiabatic. But again, as those air uh, as those air parcels rhyme upward, as those uh, columns of air push upward, they cool adiabatically, and at some point uh, they become neutrally or negatively buoyant. And usually that's where the top of the boundary layer is because the air can't go any higher than that. But that process is what pushes the atmospheric boundary layer upward and causes it to expand during the day and shrink during the night. Because at night the heating dies off, so now you don't have uh, you don't have that uh, heating of the adjacent air. The near surface layer of the air doesn't heat up anymore. But what does happen is you get radiational cooling from the Earth. Uh, the Earth emits long wave radiation to uh, expend some of its energy. In the process of doing that, it will cool the air near the ground level. That cold air becomes negatively buoyant. And because it's now stable, a, the air can't rise anymore. So those uh, rising motions, those upward moving thermals, are no longer there during the nighttime. And that's why the boundary layer shrinks or it contracts during the nighttime because now you don't have those rising thermals, those rising columns of air anymore because at night the ground level air is now cool and stable so it can't rise anymore. And without those rising motions, without those uh, rising columns, the atmospheric boundary layer can't go up and the natural response from the atmosphere is to bring the atmospheric boundary layer back down to the ground. So you don't, the terminal motions don't make it as high into the atmosphere and that's why the boundary layer tends to shrink at nighttime and that's largely due to the fact that the air near the ground level is stable and it's cooled off and the reason why is because the daytime heating is gone and the Earth's radiational cooling process takes over at the, uh, on the air near the ground level. So just as sort of an illustration to sort of give you an idea of what exactly is going on here. So again, during the daytime, when the sun's out, you have really strong heating occurring at ground level. So you have a region of relative, uh, really hot air near the ground. And as that air becomes, uh, since the air is so hot, it becomes buoyant. And that tends to give you rising thermals or rising columns of air. And it's those rising columns of air that basically form the boundary layer. Wherever you have these rising air parcels, these uh, th rising thermals, that's where you're going to have really strong turbulence. And again, by the way we've defined atmospheric boundary layer, the boundary layer is where you've got 
the uh, really strong turbulence, the strongest turbulence in the atmosphere. And a lot of times that turbulence, the source of that turbulence is these rising columns of air. But there are other factors that come into play as well, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But the main thing that I want to point out is the boundary layer during the daytime is primarily formed by these rising columns of air. And the reason why these air columns rise is because the, uh, air, the, uh, the air near ground level is heated up by the sun. And then right at the interface between the boundary layer and what we call the free atmosphere, uh, free atmosphere is basically where the friction is negligible. But there's not a whole lot of friction here to impede the flow. So boundary layer is where the friction is really strong, and then the free atmosphere is where the friction and turbulent motions are really weak. And right at the interface between those two is often referred to as the entrainment zone. And you'll talk more about the role of the entrainment zone as well as some of these other sections uh, shown on the screen here in some of your later dynamics courses. And then at nighttime, uh, again, the, uh, since the, uh, the sun's heating is lost, this results in cooling of the adjacent air near ground level. And now that the, uh, now that the atmosphere is relatively stable, this, this cold air can't go upward into the warmer air that's above it. So, and, and the reason why that, that is is because the, cool, the, the air near the ground level cools off much more rapidly than the air above it. So you actually end up with a region of relatively cold air right at ground level, say in the lowest 10 meters or so. And then right above that is a region of warm air. So you have a very stable atmosphere present uh, near the near ground level. And because you have a stable atmosphere, there's nothing to really set any updrafts or any uh, upward motions uh, in motion, if you will. So there's nothing to get these air columns to get uh, to get going upward. And as a consequence, the boundary layer tends to shrink. And it, this is why the boundary layer is so shallow during the nighttime is because the air near the ground level is much more stable now. You don't have those rising columns of air that are producing the strong turbulence. And those rising columns are also responsible for expanding the boundary layer upward. But since those have been taken out of the equation at nighttime, the boundary layer comes closer to the ground and the depth decreases to a few hundred meters. Or in more extreme cases, it can be at 10, 20, or 30 meters above ground level. And there are uh, exceptions to this rule, actually. Sometimes during the nighttime, uh, you can actually still get an unstable atmosphere. And sometimes you can even get an uh, interesting phenomenon where if you have a, I will say, a deep cold front with a lot of turbulent motions, sometimes you can actually mix some of this warm air aloft with the cold air near the surface. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes a passing front of some kind or some sort of current of air can actually increase the temperature at night. It's because you have this region of warm air above the ground and this region of cold air near the ground. Again, the region this, this air is getting colder because the radiation is lost. But if you get a current of air, like say a cold front or some sort of front, if you get enough turbulent mixing, you can actually bring some of this warmer air down to the ground and you can actually increase the temperature in the middle of the night. And then at some point, it will probably go back to being something cooler. And this is a phenomenon that's refer, uh, uh, that's witnessed uh, fairly often in the El Reno area. Uh, it's believed that the topography plays a role in that. But uh, just something to keep in mind, sometimes you can get, uh, can you get turbulent motions that are sufficiently turbulent to actually bring some of this warmer air down near the ground level, even in the middle of the night. But that's kind of an interesting dynamic that is also kind of an active area of research. But that's going to do it on this first segment of the boundary layer, just to first look at it and look at how exactly it forms, what its characteristics are, and what the typical life cycle is, what the typical diurnal cycle is. So that's going to do it for this first segment. And in the next segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of turbulence. So with that, I will see you all there.